Imagine a room. Walls around you. It's uncomfortable. It's stagnant. It's hard to breathe. There's a pressure on your chest. You can feel the weight of the world holding you there. You can't escape it. Everything about the room stays the same, but it feels smaller with each passing day. And you can remember a life where this room wasn't familiar. You were the one on the outside looking in, but something happened and now you're here. There are chains around you that you can't seem to break. You feel powerless and your thoughts are so loud that you can't hear the truth. This is fear and fear is a liar. This darkness can't last. There is a light that cuts through, cuts through chains made of steel and walls made of stone. When we grab onto this light, it pulls us up, breaks us free from the grasp of this darkness. The momentum builds beneath us. We can stand, we can run, we can live in freedom. There is a voice that drowns out the lies. There is a peace that stills the chaos. And his name is Jesus. God versus fear is a constant battle that the Christian has to face in his life. Uh, no matter what stage of you know, your walk with Christ you are in, it is an inevitable truth that you and I would have to walk through the valley of fear. Uh, the giants of faith, the giants of faith in the Bible and the Christian walk as we know it, have all been through situations and stories and scenes in their life where they have seen the ups and downs of their lives, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly. And you can attest to the fact, as much as I can, that some of the common phrases that we hear uh, in our everyday lives, no matter if you're a Christian or not, are the phrases, we don't need your services anymore. Uh, you just don't fit into our organization anymore, or I don't want you, or I don't need you. Phrases like get out of my life, or you have to change, or I don't love you, you're not good enough uh, the way you are. Phrases like I'm leaving you, or would you leave me alone, or I wish I'd never met you. Phrases like I don't love you, would you leave me and get out of my life. Well, welcome to week two of our series called Fear. And today what I want to do is we, I, it's my personal desire that I'm asking God to speak to us about how we as believers and Christians are to overcome fear, and not just fear, but the fear of rejection. Now, over the next, next few weeks, we'll talk about, implore different topics as to how the Bible addresses some of the biggest fears that we have as men. And how the biggest fears that we have tends to creep into the way we look at our lives and the way we approach our Christianity many of the time. Uh, many people look at their lives and say, why do I have to go through rejection? Uh, what have I done wrong? There are numerous occasions in my life that I can recall and I can go over where I've thought about why I personally have had to go through rejection from certain people. People that I've loved, people that have loved me, apparently. People that, you know, I thought would never, ever backstab me, that would ev never, ever deceive me. People that I helped. Uh, don't you find that surprising? People that you've loved more deeply are the ones that could hurt you more, right? You've been there. Uh, some of y'all are like looking at me, and like, I don't know about you. Uh, I've been there. I'm sorry about you because I've been burnt a lot. I've been there. I've complained to God a lot about those situations, about those people. 
I've, I've had my conversations and my gripes with God about individuals like that. But I've always asked God, God, why me? And then I think about Jesus because Jesus fed people. He walked with people. He talked to them. He went to their homes. He went out of his way to go into people's miseries and death, situations of death. He healed people. He, uh, he raised the dead. He healed the sick. Jesus in his embodiment was the perfect example of perfect. Are you understanding what I'm saying? He was a perfect person. And no matter how much I say, why me? Oh, I didn't do anything. Jesus had all the reason in the world to put himself in that place and say, why me? I'm, I'm the epitome of perfect, right? But even Jesus, the Bible says, was rejected. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Even Jesus was rejected. Uh, if, if, if people rejected a perfect Jesus, it is irrational and illogical for us to expect people, people, human beings, to not reject us. The Bible talks about rejection and says, uh, for he that was, uh, he, the, the, the one that was rejected, the stone that was rejected in the context of Christ, the, the Bible says that stone became the what? The corner stone. Remember that. Uh, oftentimes what we don't understand in life is that rejection always paves the way for something much more beautiful for something much more greater. And some of us have been through situations like that in your life. Everyone has dealt with rejection. Some of you all have been denied that job. That was rejection. Some of you all were denied that promotion. That was rejection. Some of you all was broken up with. That was rejection. Some of you were not picked for the team in high school. That was rejection. Some of you were not, you know, a part of the gang. That is rejection. Uh, some of you were, did not receive that scholarship. Man, that was rejection. Some of you sent her that DM and never got the response. That was rejection. Some of you all are smiling at me. I'm sorry. I just had to say it. Uh, rejection happens every single day in our lives. And like I said, it is an inevitable truth that we as believers have to go through phases of rejection in our life. Rejection is... Uh, the action of someone to reject you for either for who you are or for either for who you, you're, you're actually not. Some people will reject you for who you are. They're like, oh, this is who you are and I just don't like it and I'm rejecting you. And some people will do just the opposite. They'll reject you for who you're not. And you're like, there's no winning here. Come on now. Like, I'm like, mm, right? But what we have to understand is this. Rejection is the weapon that the enemy uses to wound the soul. You got to understand that there is a weapon that the enemy uses to not wound the outside or not to make wounds where people can see it, but rejection is this secret weapon that the enemy uses to wound our insides, particularly our soul. It's a different kind of wound. What kind of a wound is it? It's not the one that bleeds from the outside. It's one that bleeds from the inside. Are you understanding what I'm saying? When someone bleeds from the inside, it's called hemorrhaging. And, and when you hemorrhage, you don't even know sometimes that you're hemorrhaging. Are you understanding what I'm saying? There are people that have been rejected probably here, and you probably know that you were rejected at some point, but there is a part of you that doesn't know that you still have wounds that are hemorrhaging. And, you're, you're, you're le and, and a, a very good example of that is some of y'all, it would not show on the outside. It will show in your personality. It will show in your character. It will show in the way that you, you say certain things, the way you talk to people, the way you deal with other people. It will reflect in all of that. The way you communicate will reflect on the things that you have gone through in life and the internal wounds that you have suffered. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, and this is what we started with last week, the Bible says this, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but instead he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. We talked last week as to how God and fear cannot coexist with each other. It's either God or either fear. It's not an and-and situation. It's not a little bit of God, a little bit of... No, it's not that. We can never have those two coexist together. It, God is basically like, if you serve me, fear has no place in my relationship with you, right? So we talked about that. We talked about how the fear versus God war and this battle rages every single day in our lives. 
God has not given us a spirit of fear, and yet so many people live paralyzed by fear, especially of the fear of being rejected. And this does not come from God, and I said this last week, it does not originate from God, and we are going to let God's word empower us to overcome this fear of rejection. Maybe something that you've been in through in the past, maybe something that you're dealing with right now, but I'm telling you something very honestly. There is everything in this word to remind you that his power and his strength is all that you need to overcome the fear of rejection that rules over your heart. If I were to be honest with you and acknowledge to you, uh, so much of my life has been consumed with trying to please people. So much of my life I have spent investing in different methods and ways. And if you ask me, I can give you a hundred ways to please people. I can write a book about it because that's who I was. I was a people pleaser because I had this fear, this inherent fear, this secret fear that was inside of me that I would be rejected by people. I thought that if I performed, then people would like me and that, you know, if I came up to their standards and if I did what they did and what they expected me to do, maybe I would be cool and I would be, you know, accepted. But man, it's something that has haunted me for the rest of my life when I've I've dealt with situations like that. Even as a young minister, if I could look back at my life, as I would, when I would preach and I would get off the stage, the first thing I would want to know afterwards is, man, how do I do? I would go up to my dad. I would go up to my mom. I would go up to my pastor. I would go up to the worship leader. I would go up to this person or that person. I'm like, hey, man, how's the message today? Uh, what would you think about? Uh, did I do good? Like, like how, how's that point? Like, I, I said that. Did you like what I, but I was on this constant quest for approval and recognition In this world, the social media world that we're living in right now, man, we're challenged with that every single day. We are in this constant need for approval, man. And this is a very, very dangerous, and the truth is this, that that where many of us are living is exactly in that place. We're in this constant need for approval, and when we don't get the approval, it happens to wound us from the inside. There are a lot of people that are wounded from the inside sitting over here today. You're living this secret life of wounds and pain, and sometimes you won't talk about it, but it'll come out in the way you say things. It'll come out in the way you do things. It'll come out in the way you treat your spouse. It'll come out with a way, in the way you te- treat people that you're talking to. Uh, it, you know, someone's trying to approach you and talk to you, and man, you, it'll reflect in the way that your defense mechanisms go up. And here's the thing, one of the scriptures show us that, that, uh, that, that dan- the danger of living by fear of rejection is Proverbs 29, 25. This is what the Bible says, follow with me. The fear of man will prove to be a snare or a trap, right? But whoever trusts in the who? Come on, whoever trusts in the Lord is kept what? Safe. This idea of a snare, this idea of a trap. Think about this animal in the wild that a hunter wants to catch and he lays out a trap. And the Bible is likening the fear of man or seeking the approval of man or seeking the nod of man to a trap that is waiting to ensnare you. Are you understanding what I'm saying? It doesn't seem that way because everybody's smiling at you. Everybody is jovial. Everybody's laughing with you. Everybody's rejoicing with you. Everybody's happy about your successes and the things that you do. And they're celebrating. They're they're applauding you. But what you don't see is it's becoming a snare and something that they're tying you into. Because without your knowledge, this applause is something that you're going to get used to. And when it stops, you're going to be like, whoa, 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 what just happened? Let's look at two rejection traps. That's what I want to do today. Two ways that we are ensnared as as we are paralyzed by the fear of rejection. And I I touched upon this in my introduction, but the first thing that the enemy uses is this trap called the desperation trap. Someone say desperation trap. Like I said, we're we're desperate for, for acceptance. We're desperate for acceptance. In the Old Testament, we saw a guy who had potential to be one of the greatest kings of all time, King Saul. You know of his story, but his greatest weakness, I would argue, and, and, his, and what paralyzed him was the fear of actually being rejected. He wanted to be loved by his people. 
He was like, man, I'm the first king of Israel. I want everybody to love me. I want everyone to keep me. I want everyone to preserve me. I want everyone to hail me. I want everyone to make sure that I am glorified. And he always wondered, what are people going to think about me? Are they going to like me? And at one point, because of fear of what people thought, he rejected God's command. And Samuel, the prophet that God had put over him, had to walk up to him and say, Saul, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24, the Bible says he repented and confessed. And he said, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's command. I was afraid of the people, so I gave in to them. So how many of us, man, we give in to the schemes and the traps of the enemy because we're afraid of people? Like I said, fear doesn't come from God. If you have God on your side, no matter what threatening forces the enemy use against you, it might be people, it might be your job, it might be your boss, it might be your friends, it could be anybody. But man, they don't stand a chance in the presence of your relationship with God because that relationship trumps fear. It trumps every possibility that fear has to threaten you. I do that very often. How, afraid, how often are you afraid of what people think? So rather than doing the right thing, you do what they think you would want that, what they want you to do. That's what you end up doing. And I remember the first time that I caved into people's opinion in a way that really affected me bad. I did the, things that I sh- I did the thing that I should not have done. It was all my friends that, that we were playing together and, and, and it, was a, it was a competition to us where we, we, we got together and we went to the supermarket and we, they said, man, we're, we're, we were all going to go play, uh, play a game and uh, cricket. We, we're going to go play cricket. For those of you who know what that sport is, uh, amazing sport, the best sport on planet Earth. Uh, uh, we're going to go... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the, we, we were going to go play cricket, and, and my friends, we would get together, and man, uh, out of nowhere, one of our friends thought of this brilliant idea and said, hey, man, uh, we're going to go to the supermarket, and we're going to buy our drinks as usual, but I'm going to challenge everyone. Each one of you, you're going to steal a cricket ball. And I said, oh, no, I'm a pastor. I, I, I'm a preacher. I can't do it. No, no. And, and it immediately it was, what? You're not going to do what we do? Well, then we don't want you as a part of our group because you're going to snitch on us, right? And these are teenagers. I'm talking about, you know, the, the young years where you're like, oh, no, but I want to, attention. I, I want to be wanted. I want to be a part of a group. So no matter how much of a Christian I was, it was crazy how that one incident led to a lifestyle. And it was just not a one and done thing, but it was next week. It was something else. It was, hey, I challenge you to do this. And it was not because we couldn't afford it. It was not because we couldn't pay this much of money to get a ball. It was more the thrill that we had when we would pay for our drink and not for the ball. And we would walk out and the smile on everybody's faces that said, whoa, we just did this, which made it okay, which made it okay for me to do things in the future that would have an impact on my life that would get me into trouble and so on and so forth. I'm not proud of those things. I'm not, and and by all means, I'm being humble when I say this, but there are things in my life, decisions that I've made in my life as a youngster that has haunted me ever since. And I did it because I wanted to be accepted by a few group of people that I don't even talk to today. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Because back then, they were BFFs. They were the ones that, oh, man, if you were around them, that defined who you were. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Like, they were your definition of the perfect group. Like, you were cool. You were wanted. You, you walked with a whatever, man. But today, I'd, I don't even know where they are. Shoot, I, I remember two of their names. I don't even remember the other two names. But I'm like, the stupidity, forgive me, of those teenage years where I thought that the influence of friends is what I needed or the, 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 the applaud of friends is what I needed to be able to get ahead in life. And that's what the Bible says, the fear of man will prove to be a snare. It's a trap, y'all. So many of us, so many great people today want to please God with sexual purity and single people here, I want to talk to you this morning with sexual purity and they wait until they get married to give themselves to their spouse but instead wanting the approval of someone, they'll give away their virginity and you're like, oh, it's, it's the person that I'm going to marry anyways or I want to marry but, but you give it away because someone thinks that virginity is not cool or holding on to that sacred decision that you made is not cool 
They will give their body away and they will jump from bed to bed to bed to bed seeking the approval till they find it. Many times they don't. Well, they think his approval is not ending up, they would, would not end up being approval. They give their body away. Please love me. Pretending like sex equals love and when sex outside of marriage is the farthest thing from real spiritual, physical intimacy, their cry is, please accept me. And that is a trap is what the Bible says, man. There is this trap that the enemy is trying to ensnare us in and God is looking at you and me and saying, do not fear these traps. Do not have a fear of what that would be, you know, what impact that would cause because half of these people, man, that tell you how it's supposed to be done. Don't pay your bills. They don't pay your everyday food. They they don't care about you. They want to tell you what they think is right and they want to infiltrate your mind with that. Yep. People spend hours on their body, on their hair, on their image, on their face, and they're puffing up, moving down, moving around. You know, that, that was me growing up. Everything I cared about was self-image because for me, everyone said, if you look good, you're cool. If you dress a certain way, oh yeah, you're, you're all of that and a little more. So my investment, instead of reading the Bible and instead of you worshiping God, I spend most of my time in front of the mirror, right? Because somebody told me that this, this facial cream called Fair and Lovely will make me fairer. And, and, and people around me told me that Dark people ain't cool enough and you have to be lighter skinned to be cool enough. All my energy went into paying for this cream that would never ever work. I feel like suing them, but would never, the advertisements told me they would, the models told me they would, the Bollywood actors told me they would, but you know what happened? It never did. And I'm mad and I'm upset and I'm frustrated. But guess what? I spent too much of time worrying about what somebody else thought was what I needed to... Are you understanding what I'm saying? I was seeking approval in all the wrong places. And God's like, dude, wake up. The only person you need approval is from me. Right? And as cliche as that might sound, that's our voices every day. Please like me. If I buy this car, they might like me. If I buy this kind of house in this particular neighborhood, maybe I might be as cool as them. Or if I, if I, if I join this club or if I go to this restaurant, if, if I do this or that, man, if I compromise my integrity and don't do what I believe is more important, but I do what, what you like, what you like me to do, man, will you accept me? Would you approve of me? And if you do, man, that's what I, that's what I value. But who cares about what God thinks, right? I know so many people who live for their parents' dream. I got to make dad happy. I got to make mom happy because I'm, it's so important that they tell me that they're proud of me. Shoot, I know a friend of mine, his, his, his dad passed away 10 years ago and they're still wanting to make, he's still wanting to make his dad proud. And I'm like, good for you, man. But honestly, you, you, you got to live your dream. Like you got to do what's best for you right now, right? With all respect, I know so many great girls who love God so much and want so desperately to have an intimate spiritual covenant of marriage and, and, and these girls, man, they, they, it pains me to know that they settle and they marry some non-Christian or somebody that's not equally yoked with them, this self-centered guy because these girls simply want to be loved and they made this quick shortcut decision that affects them for the rest of their lives because they want somebody to approve them, they want somebody to love them Single people sitting over here listening to me, don't settle because somebody is drawing lines and boundaries and telling you to do certain things. You trust in God for who he wants to bring in your life and God will honor you in his time. Don't settle for mediocrity. The fear of man. The Bible says it proves to be a snare. You want to be accepted so bad that you get... You get close to people, man. And this happens in relationships, everyday relationships. We want to be so, somebody, because we don't get accepted in one place, we want to be accepted, so you cling on to anything. And, and there are some people that are created to be vacuums, man. They're vacuum cleaners. They, they, they exist everywhere in your job, right? They're, they, they're, they're in church. They're in your family, right? You go right next to them, they're like, and then you're gone. I don't see you after that. 
Because for you, you just want someone to accept you and what you don't know is they're just vacuuming you into this deep hole and I don't hear from you after that and I'm like, hey, what's up? I don't see you. In ch- I, I, I've not seen you. Oh, you know, I met this person and they're taking a lot of my time and I'm like, yep, that's a problem. That's a problem. Because sometimes there is this, 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 this desperation trap that we fall into, this desperation for acceptance, this desperation to, to say, man, I really want someone to accept me. And because of this, then we fall into this trap of the enemy. That's what the Bible calls it, a trap. Second point. It's just the opposite of the first one. The first one is the desperation trap. The second one is the high walls trap. That's what I call it, the high walls trap. It's not the trap that says, man, I'm desperate and and the fear of man makes me desperate to crave this attention. It's more of the, just the opposite that says, uh, man, I, I, you know, I, I have these high walls around me. It's those who want to be overly cautious, right? Those, those people that says, I've been hurt before and I'm not going to let anyone hurt me ever, 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 ever again, pastor. I'm never going to trust anyone ever again, pastor. I'll keep an arm's distance because, by golly, man, I'm, I'm not going to let you do to me what he did to me or she did to me or they did to me or that church did to me. No, I'm not. You know what the Bible tells us about that kind of a person? Listen, Proverbs 28, 14. I love Proverbs. Uh, this is what Solomon says, right? He says this, Blessed is the man who always fears the Lord, but he who hardens his heart falls into trouble. We have so many people around us, man. Your hearts are hardened. Hardened because of various things, because your heart has been through a lot. You've been put out there to dry sometimes, and it just hardens because of that. Some people have left you hanging. Some people have rejected you, and you're like, I don't want to go through that again. The fear of rejection comes from the fact that somebody hurt you somewhere, it might be 10 years ago, 15 years ago, two years ago, five months ago, one month ago, and because of that, my walls are way too high and it's so impenetrable that I'm not going to allow anybody to get through me. Do you know someone that has a hard heart? I know you're thinking about somebody, not you right now. Somebody that doesn't let others in. The Bible says we fall into troubles. Ladies, Single woman here, I I know that you can't trust men. I don't trust men. All a bunch of jerks and losers. Ladies, get off it, okay? Yeah, 98% of them are bad. I'll give that to you, okay? Fine. But there are those 2% that, that, that go to church and that are growing closer to Christ, okay? They're making an effort to look at you and smile at you and you're still looking at them and saying, nah, my walls are way too high. Give the guy a chance to surrender his life to Christ. Like, give him an opportunity, right? Like, they stop, like, building these walls around you and say, nah, 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 I did this. Yesterday that happened, so never again. I'm, psh, psh, psh. nope. Guys, same thing. Some of y'all are like uh, women, bunch of black widows. Get close to them and they sting you from the behind and mess you up. See, none of the men are saying amen, none of them saying anything right now because they know. Some of y'all have these walls so high up, man. I know so many great men who desire so much to be married, but they're not asking you out. Women, because they are scared to death, help them a little bit, smile at them a little bit, give them a little inroads. Jensen. <clears throat> just kidding, just kidding. I had to pick on somebody today. Stop being overly cautious and building walls. And that could be a family, man. Some of us build such high walls around our family. We protect our kids so much. We protect our, our wife so much. You don't want, want your wife to go anywhere. I'm like, dude, calm down. Like, are you serious? Like, some wives, you don't want your, your husbands to go out there and have any fun. Calm down. Let him go. Let him go have some barbecue. Let him go and play paintball. Come on, man. Can I hear a name? some of us, man, we've been burned so much. 
For some of us, it's parental conflict. For some of us, it's sibling conflict. Or maybe this church conflict that you've been through sometime in the past, man. But maybe you don't want to share Jesus with someone because you're afraid that they may reject you. And that was me for a long time. I would be afraid to go and share Jesus because, man, I've been rejected so much that they look at me and say, nah, I don't want to hear about you, Jesus. And you know the natural tendency inside of me is to shrink, it's to be shunned, it's to go into my cocoon and say, oh no, you don't want Jesus, I'm so offended. And I'm like, why are you offended? Like, this is Jesus we're talking about. If they offend you, go back next week, invite them to church again. You know what the national average is? They say that you have to invite somebody eight times for them to even consider coming to your church because they know how passionate you are about that particular church that you go to. Just because they said, oh, no, I, I'm not going to come to church, don't take offense to it. They're not saying no to you. They're just saying no to some kind of disappointment they went through. They, they're just saying no to that steeple that, that they looked at and they had a bad experience with. They're just saying no to that childhood experience they had in church somewhere down the line. They're just saying bad to some extent, not to you. Don't be rejected. You know what the Bible says about that? John 12, 42. It says this, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue for the loved praise for men more than praise from God. Man, fear of man, it's a snare, it's a trap. And we are either really desperate or we're either building walls around us. These two kinds of fears. Stop being fearful about sharing your faith with other people. It's something that God wants you to do. Don't be scared about inviting people into the body of Christ. Invite them to come to church, man. How do we overcome this trap? I want to go over this real quick. Are you ready? Real quick, and we're going to wind up. We're going to pray for a little bit. All right, how do we overcome this trap? The Bible teaches us two principles, two principles, real quick. In the Old Testament, in 1 Kings chapter 22, right, this this great story of this king called Jehoshaphat. He was the king of this, this land called Judah, and he was having this conversation with the king of Israel. And, and the king of Israel said, uh, in, in chapter number 22, in verse number 4, I think, the king of Israel said, Jehoshaphat, will you go into battle with me, and we will partner up to help take back what rightly belongs to us. And Jehoshaphat responded this way, in verse number 5, he said to the king of Israel, first seek the counsel of the Lord. Point number one. Say yes to pleasing God. You see, this is a head of a state talking. It was not a, oh, let me call a cabinet meeting. Let me call a committee meeting. Let me consult with my best friend. Let me consult with my wife. Let me consult with my close-knit group. Let me consult with my, you you get what I'm saying? No, no, no. His first response to a king. This is two kings speaking, right? Imagine it. Uh, you know, the, 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 the president of China and the president of the United States sitting at a table and, and one president asking the other person or something and the president, instead of giving an answer to him of saying, oh, I'll think about it or I'll ask my cabinet about it or, or my, you know, my senators, whatever. He looks at him and says, let me ask God about it. Isn't that amazing? My fear of rejection can be combated when I go into the presence of God. Man, when you're faced with making a decision, what do you do? You don't ask, what will people think? Because that's normally what we do. The first thing we do is, man, my decision is going to affect a lot of people. My coworkers, my boss, my friends, my friend's friends, my neighbors, my neighbor's uncle. You care, you, like, it's normal for us to be concerned about everybody and their mother-in-law instead of worrying about what God thinks. It is so important, not what my coworkers think. The first thing is we ask God, man, God, what do you think about this? We seek to please God in all we do. John chapter 5 and verse 30, this is what the Bible says, by myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Even Jesus very boldly claims and says, no, it's not my, I, I'm here to please my Father in heaven. How many of you go out with every decision that you have to make in your life, every step that you have to take in your life, how many of you focus on what God wants in my life? It's so critical for us to understand that that we have to put importance to what God wants in our lives more than anything else. 
I love the story about uh, probably one of the greatest evangelists of our time, uh, of, of modern history, uh, G. Campbell Morgan. I've followed a lot of his writings and a lot of his theology. And, and, and in 1988, uh, sorry, sorry, 1888, he stood before three men uh, in his church uh, denomination who had the power to determine if he was called to preach or not. All right? He had to stand in front of three men who had to decide if they wanted to give him an ordination to preach, a license to preach. And as he preached to them, and as he did his piece, and as they got done, they, the three men walked out and put a notice on the wall. And on that notice were, was a list of people that were accepted and rejected. And as Campbell looked through that list, he found his name under the rejected list. It wasn't there. His name wasn't there. Some of you know that feeling when your name isn't there. When you, they missed, they missed out on you. They, they, they totally ignored you. You poured out your heart and your life in a certain direction and then some person came up to you and said they rejected you. It could be a company that you gave your everything to. But all it took was a minute for them to decide that they don't need you anymore. You don't have what it takes. Those, those phrases that I used towards the beginning of my message... It was that day that Campbell was crushed. He looked on that second list and there was his name, the one that was rejected. Devastated, the story is told about how he sent his dad a telegram back in the day, the telegram, and he simply had one word on the telegram. He said, Dad, rejected. A few days later, his very wise dad sent him a telegram back and Morgan said the message from his father changed his life forever. And the message was simply this. It said, rejected by men, comma, accepted by God. And that's where I want to fall. I will be rejected by people that's 100%. I'm, I'm, I'm positive. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. Unavoidable. Something that's going to happen no matter how much you like it or not. But what am I going to do? You too, if you're following Christ, man, you, you know what? You are going to be rejected by people. In Isaiah 53, it was prophesied of Jesus that he would be despised and he would be rejected by man. What do you think that you could do when people reject you? Man, God is looking at you and saying, no matter how much people reject you, that's what Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and when you seek that, everything else will be added unto you. Man, that's, that's my focus in life. When I have to say yes to God, all these things shall follow me, man. When I say yes to everything else and then I keep God secondary, is when I have to worry about things that I place before God. But when I place God before all the other things, my trust is in God and not these things because then I don't have to worry when things around me fail. I just know that my trust is in God and I know for sure that he will never fail. What is your trust in today? The second point, I say no to pleasing people. We say no to pleasing people. We say no to pleasing people. We say no to pleasing people. And I can't say that enough. Now, please don't take this out of context and say, Pastor Ash has told us that we need to be rude to everyone around. Nah, that's not what I'm trying to say here. Be nice to other people. Love people. Love God. Love people. That's what we're all about. We're supposed to show love and grace, man. But I love the way Isaiah asked this question. He said this. Who are you that you fear mortal men? Who are you that you fear the opinions of people, the sons of men, but who, who, who are we but grass, is what Isaiah says. Why do you fear people, he says, that, that, that you forget the Lord God, your maker? That's what he's basically saying. Put your trust in him. And that's the way it is. Look at the way Paul asked the pressing question to the Galatians in Galatians 1 and verse 10. He says this, uh, he asks himself, ask yourself, ask sincerely, am I now trying to win the approval of men or God? Or am I trying to please men? This is what I've started to do. I've, I've changed the way I look at life. I've tried it all. Honestly, I've, I've been exhausted. I've exhausted all my resources. I've tried everything, spent my money on fair and lovely, all that stuff, and now my mind is all made up. Right? Not that I care about my complexion anymore. I don't care anymore. I just use some dove and wash my face. That, that's all I do. I, I, I've decided in my heart, that I'm going to live for the audience of one. I have. My heart is made up. And it's going to, I'm not going to say it's going to take a lot. It's, you, you can try all you want. You're not going to change my mind. 
Because the way I approach these two things, the way I approach this fear that's inside of me of rejection, because I've been through so much, I had my own teacher that looked at me and said, Ashish, you will amount to nothing. The same person that looked, that had to look at me and, and pr- speak life over me, that had to promote me, that had to make sure that I learned, that made sure that I, I was promoted, was the same person that despised me, the same person that looked, played in my eyes with my father sitting next to me, looked at me and said, this boy will amount to nothing in his life. It hurt me at that moment, tore me apart, literally tore me apart. But the day I graduated with two masters, not one, but two masters, uh, one a master's of science and the other one in theology, I I came to realize that day that I was the first in my high school class that graduated with two master's degrees. I know that's what's up. Yeah, girl. Because you know what? I don't, honestly, I don't. At that point of time, I did. I don't harbor hate. If I was to go back home today, If I was to find that teacher somewhere, I would buy her some flowers, I would get her a gift card, I would buy her dinner, I would go up to her, shake her hand, and tell her, ma'am, I thank you so much for rejecting me because tomorrow or today, you can't say that you had anything to do with what God did in my life. It's only one person that can because I decided that I was going to live for the audience of one. He deserves the glory. He deserves the praise. Y'all, you don't live for people. You don't live for the approval of people. Band, would you come up to the stage? You don't live for people to say yes or no to you. The moment you focus on people, you take your focus away from God. But the moment you give God importance and you trust in God and say, God, to you be glory, to you be honor, to you be praise. Man, God changes the landscape of your life and says, I will begin doing something in your life that nobody can ever do. Would you stand up to your feet with me? There's a story of this famed football coach, Lou Little. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all have heard of him, but coached college football for a long time, one of the leading coaches of the yesteryear. A story is told of how he was coaching this this college team. And one of his players, he would notice one of his players, one of these boys that would, would attend his training or was a part of the team, never made it to the, you know, the first team or the second team, always third string. He came if the backup to the main guy was injured, which is a rarity. That's how devalued he was, but he still came to practices. And he, little, little writes about this, 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 this incident where, or the, a series of incidents where he would notice what he presumed at that point in time to be the father of this young boy. He would often come and sit in the bleachers in the stands when they would practice. They would practice or during the games, he would would come sit down in the bleachers just looking out. Sometimes he would just look around, gaze at the trees, gaze at the skies. Not really looking at his son, but he would just look around, enjoying nature. And Lou was like, why is he even coming to practice if he doesn't want to watch his son play? Like, does he not like his son? But something amazing he said would happen was after every practice, no matter if this man watched his son play or not, practice or not he would come to practice every day and at the end of practice he would watch this young man go up to his father hug him hug him so tight he would watch the embrace of these two and he would always recount of how much they loved one another he got the news one day about from the mother of this boy she was on the phone and she called him and said Hey, uh, I just want to let you know I can I can break this to my son, but I want to let you know that my son's dad just passed away. You probably have seen him come up and sit with him, watch him play, play his games, but he was going through a terminal illness to which he succumbed. He passed away yesterday, and I just can't gather my wits around me to actually talk to him and tell him that his dad has passed. He loves you. He respects you, Coach. Would you be okay if you broke the news to him? Lou says he remembers bringing that boy in, breaking the news to him, and this boy was sobbing, crying. 
He was on the next bus going home to attend the funeral of his father. A week later, this young man shows back up for practice. Monday morning, he's there on the practice field ready to go. Doesn't say a word, goes through his routine. Come game day on Friday, he looks at his coach and says, Coach, I know I'm third string. I've never made second string. I've rarely played a, played a game this season. But I have a request. It's up to you. I'm not going to force you, but I want to play. Would you let me play today? And of course, coach said, I kind of knew where he was coming from. He probably wanted to dedicate the game to his father. So he said, you know what? It took a lot out of me and it was one of the decider games for them to go, to the, go into the playoffs. But he said, you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm still going to put him in. The young man goes in. He's playing wide receiver. Long story short, a pass comes to him, catches one of the winning touchdown passes. Celebrates. At the end of the game, every, when everything was said and done, this young man comes up to the coach and says, Coach, thank you. Thank you for putting me in. It, worked, it means the world to me. This coach looked at him and said, Son, are you okay? Are, are you okay? How are you handling things? The young man looked at him and said, Coach, you probably noticed how my dad would come over here uh, week after week and she would sit on these bleachers. But what you didn't know, because I've not had many conversations with you, is that my father was blind. My father couldn't see. He, he was blind. And uh, today would be the first day that he would actually watch me play. And, and that story, no matter how you want to take it, is, is one of those stories that remind me that when I play this game, when I play this, this, this game of life, so to speak, as the world may put it, as I walk through the trenches of life, as I walk through the highs and the lows, the valleys and the mountains, I constantly have to remind myself that I, pray, I play for the audience of one, not for everyone else. He said, I'm, I played today just because one person was watching me and I didn't care about winning playoffs, I didn't care about making playoffs. I was just happy because this was the first time my dad would ever watch me play. Because every time he would embrace me after the game, he would look at me and say, son, I wish I could see you play, but what he didn't know, I was third string. He didn't know that I'd never played regularly. But today he would know. That's what gave him joy. How many of you live for the audience of one today? Because if you don't, there are some people that struggle with identity. Some of us struggle so much. There's this, there's this quote uh, that I want to leave you with, if you could put that up. Uh, this beautiful quote by Lloyd uh, Ogilvie. Secure in God's love, I will not surrender my self-worth to the opinions and judgments of others. He says, when I am rejected, I will not retaliate. When I'm hurt, I will allow God's love to heal me. And knowing the pain of rejection, I will seek to love those who suffer from this. And it's anguish. That's powerful. That's powerful. When I'm a Christian, I approach life this way. It says, yes, I am going to be rejected. I am going to be dejected. I am going to be despised. I am going to be put down. But as a Christian, as a believer, the way I choose to look at it is I will allow God's love to heal me and knowing the pain of rejection, I will seek to love those who suffer from the pain and the anguish of rejection. Guys, today, I don't know where you are in life. There's somebody here that's probably been rejected that has rejected someone. I don't know. But you're probably in the need for a touch from God. Somebody standing over here needs to make a decision that you need a relationship with this God that holds so much more value than people give you, man. I want, to, I want the prayer partners to come up. If there's somebody here that needs prayers, it could be, you know, somebody that's dealing with rejection. It could be somebody that's dealing with something in your heart. Not just that, anything you're dealing with. It could be something in your family. It could be something with, you know, your, your finances, your job. We're a church that believes in prayer more than anything else. We spend time in prayer every Sunday, no matter what. And we're going to spend the next five minutes in prayer. So if, if you need prayer today, as the worship team just leads us in a few moments of worship, I want you to step out of your seats and I want you to come forward. If you need to just come to the altar to worship God, that's fine as well. 
But man, take this time to look at God today. Would you look at God today? Would you seek his face? Would you seek his kindness? Would you seek his love? As the worship team worships today, if there's a decision you need to make before God and say, God, I give you my life. I want to give you importance. I want to seek your kingdom. I want to seek your face before I seek anything else. Would you do that today? My God is a God that takes your rejection and turns it out into acceptance. For that which was rejected became the cornerstone. Every period of rejection that you go through in your life is just a chapter that will remind you that God is going to bring something beautiful out of you. Father, we thank you.